The church is not just a place or space, but it is a people reaching out to connect others to Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say about the church? What does it look like to be a part of this thing that we call the church? Today we want to talk for a few moments about the house, a grand gathering, which is where we are this morning, the house. Father, I ask that you would anoint your servant today as he speaks your word. May he speak nothing more, nothing less, only what you would have him to speak. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, the church was and is established by God. We have to start with that. The church was and is established by God. It is something that is built. As we turn to Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18, Jesus says something here that's very interesting to Simon Peter. And Simon Peter answered Jesus when he was asking, who do you say that I am? And Simon said, you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers or the gates of hell will not conquer it. We, meaning people, are the church. People are the church. But understand this, we occupy a place or a space. This morning, the church, we are gathered here in this building. Amen? It doesn't matter the building that we're in, but wherever the church is gathered, that's where the church exists. Any place, any space. We don't have a steeple in this building. You just save a few extra dollars. It doesn't make it any less a church. It's just a building. But make no mistake about it, this is his house. This is the church. Well, I, I want to take you to the Greek just for a moment. I don't do this often, but I want you to know the definition of what that word church means right here in this text and also throughout the New Testament. The Greek here means a, a calling out, the church. It's the definition. It means a calling out. A popular meeting. A religious congregation. A community of members on earth. An assembly. The church. The church. The church. Understand that the church is not one-dimensional. I want you to understand this. And this is really the whole outline, I guess, if you will, of this series. It's all about the thought process that the church is not one-dimensional. The church is relational. Wherever we meet, that's where the church is. But throughout the book of Acts, we're going to see some different scenarios of how the church gathers. Everybody likes to put their patent on what church should look like. Is church big? Is church small? Does church happen in buildings with steeples, or does church happen in the house? You know, there's all kind of movements throughout history, and people want to put a patent on what the church looks like. Can I tell you that you can't put a patent on what the church looks like? People have wrote books about it. This is the way church is supposed to look. This is the way church is supposed to be. And a lot of people say this is what God's doing right now within the church. Understand this. You cannot put a patent on what the church looks like because the church is made up of different people with different identities, but all reaching out to the same goal of Jesus Christ. The problem with humanity much of the time is that we try to put a patent on everything. And if you're not doing church like what we think you should be doing church, well, then you need to do it a different way. Understand, throughout the scriptures and throughout this series, we're going to see that church can happen in many different places, in many different spaces. But it's also about reaching out to people to connect them to Jesus Christ. The church is not one-dimensional. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. This is when the church is busting at the seams. Jesus dies on the cross. 
He rose again on the third day, and the church is flourishing. Now, there's much persecution, but where persecution is, the church is thriving. Acts 2, verses 44 through 47. It says this. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to the fellowship those who were being saved. The temple. The Bible says they were meeting at the temple. Now, essentially, it's a house. It's a grand gathering. It's a place big enough to hold a crowd. Would you not agree with that? The synagogue or the temple, it's where people gathered. It wasn't just a few people. It was a lot of people. And, and I love how people like to put a patent on, well, how, how big should the church be? How many is too many? Which I've always wondered about that concept. I wonder if people have this idea when they say things like, well, this church is too big or that church is too big or this place is too small. When do you put a cap on people gathering to worship? You get to a certain number and you say, whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to have to go outside and form another huddle because we have enough here. When is the place where people say, well, that's enough? Understand that throughout the scripture, there is always a grand gathering. There is great importance in coming to the house. How many know it makes a difference when you come to the house, the grand gathering of God's people? Hebrews 10, verse 25, says this. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And that scripture is truer today than it was yesterday. Do not neglect, or some translations say, forsake the meeting or the assembly of yourselves together. A few points about the house. The house is a place where focus happens. Today, there's a lot of people here in this service. There's going to be a lot of people in the second service. And this is what's taking place in the house today. We are focusing in on what is important. Everybody is focusing in on one thought process, on one theme. The house is a place where focus happens. Also, the house is a place where differences fade The house is a place where differences fade. Many people from many backgrounds here this morning, and we must understand that all of our differences today, they don't matter. There's only one that matters this morning, and that's Jesus. Amen? We we learn to worship beyond our differences. Make no mistake about it. If you cannot worship with others, then you're not focused on the one that matters. If you cannot worship with others, you are not focused on the one that matters. You hear all kind of people tore up all the time about, well, I can't go here, can't go there. Those people there, those people. You're not focused on the one who matters. People want to talk about hypocrites or this, that. Listen, you're going to find that anywhere. People have been searching for the perfect church throughout history, and it has not yet been found. You, you think it's this place. You ain't, you ain't been here long enough. You know you're somewhere long enough when you're offended. You know you're somewhere long enough where the preacher doesn't say what you want him to say. You, you know you're here long enough when songs get old. Right? Right? And you think, well, this place isn't as perfect as I thought. Well, guess what? You're going, you're going to try to find another place, and you're going to love it, and you're going to love the people, and you're going to think, these people are so amazing. You haven't spent enough time with them yet. 
you will find out they are just as messed up as someone else. How many know I'm telling the truth this morning? You cannot find the perfect place or space, but the key is the house is a place where we worship beyond our differences. I love this about the house. The house is the place where numbers are mobilized. The house is a place where numbers are mobilized because we're focused in on one theme, on one thing. I want to give a few myths this morning. There's a couple myths that that are floating out there about the church at large, and this is one of those myths. The myth of, I'm going to do my own thing. That, That you're better off on your own. Worshiping by yourself. There's only a couple problems I have with that. You can take it or leave it. One is that it's very ineffective. Your your one person holy huddle is very ineffective. Now, I might not be talking to you this morning because you're here. Maybe this is for internet land, or I just want to expose this because you're going to hear this at some point in time. Well, I just like to do my my own thing. Here's another problem with that. It's not biblical. There's no place in the Bible where people say, well, I'm just going going to do my own thing. I'm going to start my own church, the church of me. I do my own thing. That's a dangerous church to be a part of, where you can make up your own thoughts and your own ways, right? Right? Do whatever you want because it's all about you. And a lot of times people, they they make up that church because that church is easier to attend. You don't have to be anywhere but where you want to be. That's a selfish Christianity. And and that's how we set Christianity up to be. A lot of times about you, what you want to do, where you want to be. Just the kind of people you want to be around. That is not a healthy church. So the myth of I'm going to do my own thing, the the main problem I have with that, other than being effective, is that it goes against Scripture. It goes against everything Scripture teaches and preaches. I wonder when people say that, and I've heard some very, like, intellectual, Bible-reading folks say things like this. And I'm like, do you read the Bible? Like, really? Because in the book of Acts, they're meeting everywhere, any place they can, a grand gathering in a home. They're meeting out in the streets. They're meeting everywhere they can to connect others to Jesus. The house does away with isolation. I love that about the house. The house does away with isolation. You no longer feel alone. Now, there might be some who would come in the house and feel isolated because they don't know anybody. It's the church's obligation and job to reach out and to draw people in. Amen. The house should do away with isolation. The house is a place where unique identities combined to do something great. We don't talk about the amazing things this church does a lot, because I feel like we'd be talking about it every service, but this church is a giving church. It's the most generous church I've ever seen in small town USA. We give a lot from this place. We support a lot of missions. We give a lot of money for the work of the kingdom of God. Who does that? You do that. The church does that. Amen? Because our numbers together can do something great. You find the person that says, I'm going to do my own thing, and you ask them what they're doing for the kingdom of God, and it's probably really itty-bitty. But when you connect for a common cause and purpose and we can link together, then we can begin to do great and awesome things for the kingdom of God. It's a good thing when the church mobilizes and comes together. Every aspect of the church, it is relational. I've been challenged recently, which is where this series came from, about being more relational in our process of reaching people because we can't just have the grand gathering but for the sake of this morning's message that's what we're talking about but we're going to be talking about some other things next week and the week after 
But this is really the reason why we come up with team night as well, because we want to have a relational church, not just where we come and sing a few songs and we hear some preaching and we go on about our way, but no, we come to a place where we can have relational value, where we know each other. We know differences. We know faults and flaws, and it's okay because we're here to worship Jesus and to press beyond that, amen, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another. It's a relational thing. You know, from the very beginning, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. He had all the animals, but he still wasn't enough. There was a void in man. God said, God said, not the man. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. From the very beginning, we were created to be relational individuals. If we turned our relational dial up and our religious dial down, we could watch as the gathering would increase in this place called the church. The problem is people have their religious dial turned far, way, way far too up, if that's even a, a term. I'm not an English teacher. That's okay. I'm a preacher. And they have their relational dial turned way down. So that's why we, we find little small holy huddles because no one can ever see eye to eye on anything. Newsflash, I guarantee you this right now, you don't see eye to eye with me on everything. I promise you that. If we would go through the scriptures and the details of the word of God, we, we would find some places where you'd just be like, dude, you're a mess. And I, and I would say the same thing to you. And this is where we have an issue within the church is where we see differences with the details and we're like, oh, we can't work together. We, we, can't, we just can't. I just, I just don't see eye to eye. This is, this is my statement about disagreements within the church. I agree with far too much from people with other denominational backgrounds, other doctrine. I agree too much to disagree. Do you understand that? When we're talking about Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, non-denominational, because we all, we all know it's a denomination too. Um, whatever, you go down the list. Well, I, I, we can't work with them. Why? Do they believe that Jesus Christ is Savior? Do they believe that he is the Son of God? Do they believe that he is the only way that they can find forgiveness of sins? If so, I can work with them. And you find far too many fractions in the body of Christ where people say, ah, Oh, man, they're on a slippery slope. According to your opinion, according to your doctrine, but do we agree on the essentials? I'm not talking about taking away the essentials. I'm talking about are we, do we have enough to agree on to mobilize and to work together? The second myth and this is a popular thing. Maybe, maybe some have not heard of this. I'm sure some of you guys have. But this is, this is a popular myth today. Because intellect is back now. I don't know if you know that. But intellect, uh, everything goes through a season in church. Now intellect's up and it's high within the church. And people want to be real intellectual. And uh, right now there's this myth out that says, well, the church, the church is a modern day establishment. Where in the heck do you get that? Because the church is not a modern day establishment. The church is actually all throughout the New Testament. The grand gathering is all throughout the New Testament. People say, and, and the big thing coupled with this is, well, well, they met from house to house. Right here it says they met in the temple, and then they went from house to house. It wasn't just one thing. God knows how dangerous we are as people. He knows how dangerous we are because we will make a religion out of anything. We will make gospel out of anything and everything but Jesus. Why do you think we don't know exactly what Jesus looked like? Oh, we think he was some fair-skinned white boy. We're pretty wrong about that. Amen. A little blushy, rosy cheeks. Jesus, come on. I like to say it this way. Jesus was probably darker than a white man. Lighter than a dark man. He's all people. Right? I like it. It's no, it's, no, it's no debate, but we try to make Jesus what we want him to be. Right? 
Why do you think we don't have the perfect image of Jesus? We only have the words to go by, not an image. Why? Because, man, we're so crazy. We make, we make a statue out of anything. We we'll worship this. No, no, no. Look at the words. The word is our guide, amen? The word is our standard. It's dangerous when we get outside the word of God. Don't, don't make a doctrine out of house church and don't, don't say that, well, this is the way that it is. No, 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 no. It's the way you want it to be. Yeah. And, it, and it's how you receive. Listen, some people receive from that, and that's great. Allow that to happen. But don't disregard what God is doing in a grand gathering. Don't, don't disregard. I mean, I, I'm not offended by very many things. I have this no offense policy. But there's a couple things I'm pretty offended by. When people say things like this, well, God don't work in that. Who are you? I need to calm down. It's a dangerous ground to say, well, God ain't moving there. Last I checked, I think people gave their hearts and lives to Jesus. Well, God, God don't move in music like that. You better watch yourself. I and mean, I'm talking both sides of the fence, whether you're talking about Southern gospel or contemporary. Don't say God don't. Amen. I'm concerned for people that say that and have no conviction by saying it. I can't say stuff like that. Well, God, don't move like that. This is, this is what I'll say God does and doesn't do, whatever his word says. If it is outside of the context of the word of God, I want no part of it. Amen? The word is our guide, it's our standard. So that's a myth that the modern day church it's an establishment of the modern day church. Paul said in all of his letters to the church in Rome, to the church in Corinth, to the church in Philippi, to the church in Ephesus, to the church in Chloe's home. Are you with me? It wasn't one place, it wasn't one setting, it wasn't one theme, it wasn't one thing. He spread it out. I believe once again, God giving us the pattern, don't try to patent the pattern. The key is, are you meeting? Are you having a grand gathering? Are you breaking bread house to house? Are you meeting people in the streets where they are? That's the key. The problem is people try to patent everything, but it is about using everything to draw crowds into relationship with Jesus. There's one reason why we do things like Biker Sunday. That's to draw crowds into relationship with Jesus Christ. And I've obviously heard all kind of stuff about that. How we're heretics and how can we pull bikes in a church. Who, you, you're putting more value in that bike. That bike's nothing. A little roar, a little exhaust smell in God's house. A little glory cloud. It doesn't matter. The key is, are we reaching people with whatever we are doing? And then when people give their hearts and lives to Christ in a setting like that, it just totally blows the minds of the religious. Well, God can't use that. Don't say God can't use that because last I checked, God can use anything and everything to reach the lost for the kingdom of God. The house, it's any place big enough to gather a crowd. The house is any place big enough to gather a crowd. There, there were gatherings of thousands in the New Testament church. Thousands. There were grand gatherings. There were re revival meetings, if you will. Grand gatherings of thousands of people showing up. Which takes me to my next thought. The house. The house was always open to visitors. You will not find a place in the New Testament church where Jesus or his disciples or followers will go through and do a personal inventory on every person's life that shows up at a grand gathering. You won't find it. Now you will find the Holy Spirit kind of illuminating a person or a situation and Jesus will point that out. But the vast majority of people just came. Let me go ahead and tell you, with, within thousands of people that were following Jesus at times and even the disciples, there was never a personal inventory taken. Because within the church, I've heard as well, well, you shouldn't let these kind of people in. You shouldn't let those kind of people. You don't know the lifestyle that they're living. Listen, that's not my prerogative to, to say whether they can or can't come in. 
My goal is to preach the gospel. That's right. My concern is not to keep this place clean. I could care less about that. Oh, well, you just don't, you don't want to, you don't want to let that kind in your house. Last I checked in the New Testament church, they didn't care. Come in, bring it in, pack it in. Let's see the crowds gather. What kind of people were in the crowds? Drunkards, prostitutes, amen, murderers, thieves. Are you with me? This is, this is the kind of folks that would show up at the grand gathering. Tells me this, with the house, with that grand gathering, visitors were always welcome. I feel bad for places that would never see a new person come in, never have the, the wonder of what's going on in their life. I believe it's a vital part of a church. The house was always open to visitors. Jesus modeled what the church should look like. Jesus modeled it. And this is, this is the model that I want to try to, to see take shape and place here at Soul Harvest Church because I'm going to be really honest. I think there are some parts that we miss. There's some parts that we miss. There's some relational value that we miss. We can do some grand gatherings, but there's times when the relational value can be down. And I think we need to be honest about that. And this is not just a call for one person to step up. This is a call for the church to step up and rise up. Are you with me? This is, this is a call where we have to really examine what does the scripture say about the church? What does the church really look like? I, I contemplate these things all the time. Are, are we doing what we should be doing as the church? Are, are we reaching the people we should be reaching as the church? Are we being effective as we should be? I know it says about pastors that our, our job is to equip the body of Christ. And I, I contemplate often, God, am I equipping the body of Christ? And I, that has more to do than just having a good service. Equipping the body of Christ is not just preaching well. And it's also not tracking down every single person you know and giving them pats on the back and making sure everything's okay. Far too often within the church, too much pressure is put on one and a lot less pressure is put on the whole. Yeah. And also the last I read in, in, in the scriptures is how the church is united and should come together for the greater cause of the kingdom of God. And when I read stories like Nehemiah, Nehemiah mobilized the people, but the people did the work and accomplished the work of building the wall around the kingdom. So it's about the whole doing all they can, anything, everything, or nothing at all. Anything, everything, or nothing at all. Jesus modeled what the church should look like. He gathered crowds, and that's what we're talking about today, the house. Jesus gathered crowds. He also went to humble homes. See, two aspects of the ministry of Jesus. He gathered large crowds, and he went to humble homes. I don't think anybody in this place or anywhere else could disagree with those two statements. Jesus gathered large crowds, and Jesus entered humble homes and lastly, Jesus spent time with hopeless humanity. If we want to model what the church should look like, if you want to model, this is a pretty good model. Jesus modeled it. He gathered large crowds. He went to humble homes, ate with them, dined with them, and he also met in the streets with hopeless humanity. Jesus was quite comfortable talking to thousands, but he was also comfortable with talking to the one woman at the well. When everybody else would look at him and say, what in the heck is Jesus doing? Does Jesus know who that is? Does he know the kind of lifestyle that she lives? Sure he does. But his mission, his goal, was to draw hopeless humanity into relationship with him. And that's the mission of the church as well. The church... It's about connecting humanity to Christ. That's what the church is about. We do it through the grand gathering. Prayerfully, we're doing it in our homes. And prayerfully, we're trying to meet hopeless humanity where we are in our everyday life. 
The church is about connecting humanity to Christ, whether through the house, the home, or one-on-one. We must use anything and everything to bring the multitudes to Jesus. It is my prayer for this church in the next few weeks and next few months to grasp a hold of what it looks like to have a New Testament church. Beyond a service. There, listen, I love a good service. I'm a service guy. I love plan. I love service flow. I like for it to feel right. Amen. Anybody like a good service? I like a good service. Nothing worse than a busted old service where no one knows what's going on, no one knows what's happening, who knows who's singing. I like a good service, but I'm going to tell you this. There's something more to church than a service. There's something more to church than good preaching. There's something more to church than nice song selection. There's something more to church. There's a relational value that takes place within the church that sharpens people. It sharpens them and encourages them to be the men and women of God that they're called to be. We must use anything and everything to bring the multitudes to Jesus Christ. Let's stand on our feet this morning.